He said something today that I want to share with you guys. But, I, but when I'm looking around, I'm looking around the numbers of people here, and I realize not everybody can always get to the Bible study. It starts at 930, by the way. But it's a blessed time. And he said, taste and see that the Lord is good. And then he made a comment. He said, uh, get a big taste. Get a big taste. And, you know, I just wonder sometimes. I really wouldn't even plan on talking about it, but I just wonder sometimes that when we come here on Sunday mornings, to celebrate the greatest father known to mankind, uh, our God, our Father, our Savior. How much are we tasting of him from the one Sunday to the next Sunday? Are we actually in his word? Are we reading his word? I don't know. That's between you and the Lord. But I think it's a good question that we often need to hear because the reality is this, is that if you come here today on a Sunday morning and expect to be filled up and overflowing in the Holy Spirit of God and the power and the authority of Christ and Christ alone, and only this is the place that you're only coming today just to get it, it's going to run out pretty quick. Not that God's going to run out. It's just that we run out. And we need to continue to fill ourselves. And the only thing that lasts is the eternal Word of God. And so I want to encourage you, try it, come and be a part of a Bible study. If you can, I realize schedules sometimes don't allow for such, but come and become and be a part of that. Pick up your Bible if you haven't been and read just five minutes a day, just five minutes. And I'll stand before God to have to give an account of this, but I promise you that the God of the universe who loves you desperately will do more with that five minutes than you will do with all the hours in the rest of the week. You'll see because he's faithful. So that's all I'm going to talk about right there. But I am going to ask you to stand up because we're going to read. We've been singing about miracles. You knew that today, right? You knew we were we had been singing about miracles. So I want you to stand up just for a minute because we're going to read a scripture together. And this is out of Psalm 77. Verse 11 through 15. I'm just going to count one, two, three, and we're going to read this together. One, two, three. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all of your works and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You're the God who performs miracles. Your display, power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. And the one thing I want to just kind of start out with it to talk about a little bit right there was in that very first verse of, of verse 11, the second part of it, not only did it say, I will remember your deeds, but it said, I will remember your miracles of long ago. And that was an important thing for them because at the time that they were saying, I will remember, things were a little dry. Just like they can get in our lives. He goes on and, he's, and he says, I will consider all of your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. What God is as great as our God? What God do you know that's as great as our God? Tell me. Tell me. There's not one. You are the God. He is the God that performs miracles. And unbelievably, and it's hard to understand how and why he chooses to do it, but he chooses to do it through you, Amen. through me, through each and every one of us when we let him. You see, we serve a God that's miraculous and he's awesome. And the words that I'm using right now don't even begin to describe how great he is. He has so many names that we know of that are in the Bible, then others that we can yet probably have even begun to understand. But Abba Father, for example, our Daddy God, Holy Father, Father of the Fatherless, Father the Potter, Father who is in heaven, God and Father of all. And that's a big one. God and Father of all. Because, you know, in our world today, it's about as shaken up and mixed up as it comes. In our nation, 
even today, there is racism. There is segregation. And the God, the Father of all, said that when he created the heavens and the earth and he took the dust from the earth and he blew life into it and he created man in his very own image, the very image of God he created them, every one of us, every color, every nationality, and there's some common things that run through every single bit of that. You know what that is? I mean nothing by offense, but I will call that you're an African-American man, so you're dark-skinned. And I'm a Caucasian man, and I have white skin. And I would bet my life on it that if you came up here, and I came up here, and I cut a small place in my hand and revealed the color of what's inside my skin, the color of my blood is the same color as his blood. And I would venture to say as well that the very air that we're breathing in here today is the very same air. And I venture to say that the heart in our bodies that's beating right now is the same heart because we have one God, one God who is father of all. And you know, so often we get confused about this thing called miracles. Has anybody ever been faithful? Well, let me, let me ask this a different way. When you're faithful to tithing to the church, and you go to God and you find some time where there's a moment in time, and it doesn't have to be about money. It can mean you have a family issue or you have a, a problem with your job or you have a problem with paying your house note or whatever. And you go to God and you say, God, I just need help. You don't think that he saw your heart when you made the check or you put the cash or you went online and you gave to his church? You don't think he saw that? And then will we see that miracle that comes when he meets that particular need along the way? And will we remember that because we were faithful, he just wanted to show his child, I am always faithful. Because, see, we can just get so twisted up in all kinds of miracles. And there's nothing wrong with that because we should live in a world. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you this, that, that if you haven't seen a miracle recently, Look to your right. Look to your left. You just looked at a miracle. You just looked at a miracle. Because I'll tell you this, if you don't believe me, tell your, start, tell your heart to stop beating. Go ahead. Tell it. God is the author of life. Tell the air that's going in and out of your lungs right now, tell it to stop. You can't do it. It's the miraculous hand of a miraculous God who loves us desperately. But see, even in all of that goodness that he gives us, so often we can lose track of the greatest miracle that we've ever known to mankind, and that is the forgiveness and the redemption of sin that Jesus Christ brought for each and every one of us. There is no greater miracle. I hope that today, as in any day that you come to church, that you're willing to allow your heart to be bare before God. Because, see, the reality is sometimes I would have expected a comment about the fact that the forgiveness and redemption of sin only comes from Jesus Christ and no place else. I would have, I would have almost thought that the whole church would have had found an opportunity to praise God, to say hallelujah to the Lamb of God, because only he can do such a thing. But, see, I think sometimes that we... We get, we get, we get numb to the gospel. Does that make sense? When I was in Hong Kong recently, we were in a school with, with several hundred kids, and it wasn't a Christian school, but there were a lot of Christians there, but there was also a lot of teachers that were not Christians. And they have missionaries come through there because the church is open to allowing missionaries coming through there. And so these teachers hear the gospel all the time. And one of the ladies that actually invited me, she told me, she said, I just got to tell you that God showed up in such a great way today that many of the teachers that I invited to come that are not saved actually told me today that 
that God really touched them by the things you said. See, because, but, but I'm not saying that, it, that I'm the reason. I'm just saying that I was a vessel and I hope to God that I was prepared and I believe I was ready to, for him to use me the way he decided to use me. And that's what we need to find is that excitement. Just like we'll celebrate today as being Father's Day, we need to find that excitement in being known that we're a child of God and that we have an opportunity to learn about God by reading his word and by, being, by finding out more about who he really is and who he wants us to be. Because see, that miracle I talked about, Jesus on the cross, paying the price for our sin, forgiving us, redeeming us, I mean, that's a miracle. But this God that's a God of, and a father of second chances, you, have you met him? Do you know him? Have you ever had reason to say, well, Lord, I messed up again? That's the God and father of not only second chances, but third chances. And I don't know about you, fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth and ninth and tenth and twelfth and four, twenty and four hundred and a thousand so high that I don't even really want to count because then I'm going to start making myself feel really bad. But he's such a good God. You know, today is Father's Day, and that's a, a glorious thing. And we recognize and we celebrate all the fathers as we already have. But, you know, even in this day, this can be a tough day. Because, see, some of our fathers no longer are living on this earth. To others, you may have feelings that, uh, that, uh, of emptiness because maybe you never knew your father. Or maybe they never want to have anything to do with you. To some, the memories of a father or a father figure evoke so many bad emotions like pain and anger and bitterness and even hatred that even to see a Father's Day advertisement on TV, it just brings you to just this uncontrollable, almost rage. But if that's you, you're in a good place today. Because I want us to pause a moment and allow the Holy Spirit to just deal and to pour forth his salve of healing on any hurt, broken heart that's in here today. Because, see, that's the God and Father of all. That's the God and Father of all. So you say, what's this salve of healing? Well, it's forgiveness. It's the one thing that we count on each and every day of our life. I mean, can you imagine this? The God of the universe with Jesus by his side decided to create man and woman, and yet <laughs> they both knew the depravity of what they were creating. They both knew what was going to come forth. And hard, that, hard as is, that is to understand, they knew that their creation is going to betray them. They knew exactly the cost of that betrayal. I mean, why would God do such a thing, much less continue the perpetuation of his creation? That's a big question. And about the only way that my small mind can get around it is that simply this, God is God and he chose to. And aren't we glad that he did? Amen. Amen. See, God's plan was based upon love. And that's a love that we can only just beginning. We're just at a beginning stage, even from this whole entire life that we'll spend on this earth, 70, 80, 100 years, whatever it may be, that we will, all those years, we will never fully understand the love of God. See, God's plan was is continued in his creation, and it was never based upon whether I said I understood it or not. Amen. See, God said, and he, was, and he gives us all these little hints. Of course, you got to read the Bible to get them. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. Many of you know this, and if you don't, I want you to pay attention to this. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, at best, it is difficult to understand the completeness of God's love, much less understand all of his ways. 
I have a hard time understanding my own way. You know, I don't know if it's an age thing, but, you know, have you ever... Okay, I'll just say that I'm the only one to protect you from this. The other day, about two or three weeks ago, my granddaughter was in the car with me, and we were going to go to Walmart. And we're driving down, if you know this one over here, we're driving on the outer road, you know, that kind of goes by some other stores. And so as we were passing by the home store, my granddaughter is six, and so she's learning to read. So she goes, oh, there's the home store, because she read it. I said, oh, that's really great. And I was just talking about it. I turned down there. I drive all the way up. We park the car. We get out, and we walk in. And I look around, and I think, where am I at? I thought I was walking into Walmart. I got totally distracted. I'm, I'm driving. She says, home store. I just turned right in there. And she's not saying anything. She just figures, well, Papa knows where we're going. I'm glad that won't happen to you. <laughs> you know, Paul, who wrote a lot of the New Testament, as you're aware, see, he suffered a much. In fact, he was told he was going to suffer much for the sake of Christ. But he was convinced of one thing. He was convinced, as we'll read in Romans 8, verse 37 through 39, he said, no, in all these things. So what are all these things? Every trial, every trouble, every struggle, every pain, every unanswered question, every problem that you can ever imagine. In all of that, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, he said, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I mean, all these things were already worked out. You ever think about that? All this stuff that we're going to go through has already been worked out. It's all been worked out in the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of our God. And you know, you may say, well, how could that be? Well, let's go to the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Now, that's good, right? Because you know as well as I do, none of us are ever going to be good enough to enter into heaven. There had to be one better than us that made the way for us. But this is the part I want you to catch. The next part of the verse is, This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I mean, can you possibly imagine? It, 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 sometimes it's amazing when you think about it that all of what took place, even as in come to creation all the way to the cross and all the things that took place past that time, all the grace that mankind will ever need was stored up in Jesus before he created anything. I don't know how to get my head around that. So it can really be truly said that even before the beginning, God's plan was set out upon pouring grace upon sinners. And if he's willing to forgive me, especially me, then I mean... Any, well, and if he forgives me, then I, since he's not a respecter of persons, I know he'll forgive you too. Amen. So the reality is that if that's true, which it is, who am I? Who are you to withhold such grace, mercy, and forgiveness from others? And we do. We can. But here's even one step beyond that. Not more important, but equally as important. Who are we not to forgive ourselves? Because see, it says in Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And do you know without mercy and without grace and without forgiveness, there is no eternal life? Did you know that? The eternal, the gift of life that comes through Christ, that he alone was the only one that could provide. He proved it and he paid for it. He proved the validity of his love for each of us in his willingness to pay the price for our sin, my sin, your sin. And he did it by dying on a cross, giving it all. Grace, mercy, and forgiveness is ours for the taking. I don't know if you were in here earlier, Brother Doug, but when I, I said something about taste and see that the Lord is good, and I said, take, get a big taste, I, I told him about, you know, but you know, this is the reality right here, is that, that it's this grace, mercy, and forgiveness, it is for us, and we need to taste and see how good it is, and we need to take a big taste of it. We need to drink it in, and drink it in, and drink it in. Amen. When we do, we're the ones that benefit. I mean, we're commanded of God to give it away, but yeah, we, man, there's a problem. When someone really hurts us, it's like, ah, I just can't forgive them because that's like, that's going to condone what they did. No, that's not what it is. Jesus didn't die on the cross for my sin and your sin to condone our sin. No, he died on it to say, I'm greater than all of that death. I am life. And to those that trust in me, you will have life. But see, what happens is that forgiveness, harv or, pardon me, forgiveness yields a harvest of freedom. But unforgiveness yields even a greater harvest, but not a good harvest. Yeah, an unforgiven spirit is a prescription for bitterness, for anger, for hate, for pain, and sin. The act of withholding forgiveness just yields more of the same. That scripture that says you just reap what you sow, well, it's true. And in fact, most oftenly, when I or you or anyone else chooses not to forgive somebody, the reality is it really doesn't affect them at all, but it is having one major havoc on your life. And if you hold on to it long enough, it's going to pay a, a, a price that you don't want to pay. Because see, this, this word, this gift of God, forgiveness, it's that divine salve of freedom that results in a full and overflowing life. Anybody here want to live a full and overflowing life? Okay, five of us did. I know you, church in the park, you know, I, I minister to a lot of guys that are, that are broken and down and out and, and, um, you ask them things like this and, you know, you'll get a percentage of people that raise their hands, but I know the reality. If you ask the right question, really everybody will say yes to it. Most of the time. It's just not everybody's so willing to put their hand up. I'm not sure what that's all about. But forgiveness is that divine salve for freedom. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads just a moment. Because here's, here's where really so the rubber of Jesus Christ meets the road of our life. And if Jesus is our vehicle into eternity, and yet there's no wheels on it, then there's no way we can ever travel. So what we're going to deal with right now because I know there's somebody here that needs to deal with this unforgiveness in their heart. And it may be towards your father or a father figure. It may be towards anyone else. But I want you, because I know the Lord Jesus wants you to be free today. So I'm going to pray. And as I pray, I want you to, in your eyes, in your heart, I want you to see that person that you've been withholding grace, mercy, and forgiveness from. I want you to see them. And the first person I'm going to pray for is you. Because when we do not extend a hand of forgiveness to someone else, then we ourselves are in sin. And the Bible tells us that, that we ourselves then are not forgiven. And that's bondage. And that is not what Jesus paid the price for. 
So, Father, I thank you today in Jesus' name for this, for the glory of your presence, the glory of your church, the glory of the body of Christ that you have gathered here today. And, Lord, I know that there's broken hearts here over unforgiveness. There are those that have been hurt, harmed in a way that they say is impossible to ever get past. And yet, Lord Jesus, you saw our sin even before we were born. And you said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You made a way where there otherwise appeared to be no way. So, Father, for that person or persons that you know their heart, you see everything about them right now, those that are in sin because they're withholding the greatest gift that you've ever given us, which was eternal life, and through that, the forgiveness of our sins. Then, Father, I ask you to see their heart and to forgive them. I pray, Father, you would give them a broken spirit that right now they would go before you and they would say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. I have withheld forgiveness and compassion and mercy and grace from other people. And I know that is wrong and I want to be free today. I know that you're a God that says if we confess our sins, that you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us, purify us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, I stand naked before you today. I confess that I'm a sinner. I'm in sin, and I'm asking you to forgive me, and I'm thanking you at the same time because you are faithful to forgive me of that sin. And, Father, the second part of this is that you, I know, would desire that your children, those that have been in bonded to this, this unforgiveness, would offer a gift of forgiveness to those that have harmed them. So, Father, on their behalf, I pray you touch their hearts now that they would agree that we come before you, Father, and we say, forgive us and help us today to give that person, I want you to see that person or persons, to give them a gift of forgiveness. I want you to see in your spirit that you're literally handing a gift of eternal love, mercy, and grace to them. Father, I give them this gift of forgiveness and mercy and grace. And I will not, in the name of Jesus, take it back. I will trust you because I know I can't trust me. I lay it down before your feet, Father. I trust you, Jesus, to do the impossible. And Lord, help me that if an hour from now or tomorrow morning I awake and I pick up this burden again, that I have the strength only given by you to lay it back down at the feet of your cross, recognizing that I must do that, that I may be free. And I thank you, Father, that you will set me free. I thank you, Father, that I will not carry around that burden of sin any longer. I thank you, Father, that everything I need is in you, so I will trust you. For I believe where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And if the Holy Spirit of God dwells within me, then I am intended to be free. That is my desire. So, Father, thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for touching my heart. Thank you for breaking me open, if necessary, that I may receive the fullness of the glory that you intend for my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. The title of this message today is Father Knows Best. And I'm looking out at this crowd, and I'm thinking there's some people in here that probably remember from many, many, many years ago, there was a show called Father Knows Best, and it was actually played out on reruns for a little while. But for those of you that are probably, I'd say 40 or under, you probably have never even heard that unless you just happen to catch it on some show along the way, on some TV channel. But back in the early 50s, for a number of years, there was a show called Father's Knows Best. And, and the success of the series related to this family that it was about their interaction 
and the development of the characters through the course of that. And there was this guy named Jim Anderson, and he played the dad. And uh, the TV audience, they really connected, at least so that this writer said. He was a responsible parent that loved his wife and kids, and he was a man that uh, would help his son out on a paper route, or he would go help his daughter out at school, and he would, he would leave off important meetings just simply so that he made sure he was there for his daughter, or, or even any of his, his, other ch his other son as well. But his family came first. Do you think God the Father puts his family first? Yeah, absolutely. Praise the Lord for that, because if he didn't, I don't even want to know the other part. But you know, in the last several weeks, how many of you have been here for the last several weeks? I say the last several. Okay, cool. So you know that Pastor Jerry has been preaching uh, a series about Christ in our home. And this series, the foundations of which were laid upon the details about how a family and their interaction with one another uh, occurs, should occur, and what the Word of God has to say about it. Number one, he talks about biblical instruction to children about obeying their parents. And if you qualify as a child with a mother or father and, they, and you understand what it means to obey and you don't necessarily always like that, well, guess what? It doesn't get any easier. When you get old like me, the reality is the same thing's going to happen. You know, you don't always love to obey, but it calls you to do that. Well, because out of Ephesians 6, 1, it says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. Sounds like a command to me. And just remember, God is not just any father. He is the one true God, the one true father that sets the standard. A second thing that Pastor Jerry was talking about was also biblical instruction to wives about submitting to their husbands. There's that word submit again, and I, if that offends you, then you need to blame God. But I'm going to tell you something, ladies. If you don't have a husband that's doing the other part of what I'm getting ready to read, then you're never really going to be able to fully submit. It's going to be a tough, tough battle. Because, see, God is the one that designed the family. He designed it in a way to work in accordance with his word, with his will for each and every one of us. Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, submit yourselves to your, their, your own husbands as you do unto the Lord. Now, the third set of instruction biblically that we were given comes out of Ephesians 5.25. And this is to husbands about loving your wives and your children. Fathers, husbands, loving your wife and your children. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Amen. Ephesians 6, 4 says, fathers, do not exasperate, do not provoke your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. To those that God has blessed to be called father, Husband, that comes with great responsibility and an even greater challenge. Because, see, it's clear that God the Father, who truly knows the best, affirms these two things. To see the accomplishment of children honoring and obeying their parents, to see the application of a wife willingly will, uh, choosing to willingly submit to her husband, it can only be accomplished when it is laid upon the foundation that those of us that are fathers and husbands love as Christ love. And how did Christ love? Sacrificially, unconditionally. He gave everything for us. You know, in Acts 17, verse 24 and 28, it says that the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. 
And as some of our own poets have said, we are his offspring. In all things, God the Father knows best. By God's design, by his declaration, by his determination, our fathers even set in place. And all of it's based upon the greatest example of a father that we'll ever know, the Lord our God. He is the only true father who in love gave everything for every one of us that we might gain everything. Today, if we will be honest with ourselves, some of us fathers can admit that we've been failures. I'll admit it. I've also been uh, admit to being a failure as father. And I did it both at what, and actually this is what happens for all of us, both at what we thought was required and especially as to what, we, what God requires of us. But see, we need to be careful. And here's the thing you really need to hear, guys. We need to be careful not to give up just because we messed up. Not to give up just because we messed up. Because, see, that's so easy, right? Well, I did it wrong this time, and I did it wrong this time, and... <sighs> but here's some good news. You know this guy named Adam? He's in the Bible. He was in the, actually the first part of the Bible. He was the one that I was talking about earlier where God created the heavens and earth and took the dust of the ground and breathed life into it, and he created this man in the image of God, and his name was Adam. He was the first, other than God, the first known father that's ever existed. But of course, he needed a wife in order that to happen, so along came Eve, created of Adam. But God gave Adam a command, and we so often miss this. The command he gave him, even before Eve, as I can understand it, was there, he said, you, I give you the, you must know, he said, you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. I've done this, we've probably done this men in, in jest along the way, saying, you know, it's because of, we, because of you, because you females, that's why we're sin in this world. No, sorry guys. The responsibility is on us. The command was given to us. There's this guy named Abram, which later was named Abraham, father of all the nations. There's a promise of a son that God gave to Abraham, but Sarah, later to be named Sarah, was convinced that that wasn't going to happen the way she planned on it happening. So she convinced her husband, go sleep with my maidservant so that I might have a son. You see anything wrong with that? There's a lot wrong with that. Number one, it was not what God told him. But then on two, uh, two later occasions, when he goes into certain lands, he says, okay, Sarah, you tell them that you're my sister. That way they won't want to kill me and take you away. Twice he did that. You think that was a plan of God? No, it was not the plan of God. And there's this guy named David. If he grew up and never got past the Bible stories, he was the shepherd boy. But he was also the guy that killed Goliath. He was also the one that was anointed the king of Israel. And when he became king of Israel, he sinned with a lady named Bathsheba. Not only an adultery, but then if that wasn't enough, he committed murder. And yet, even in all of that, guys, didn't God continue to work out all of these things? these plans with forgiveness and mercy and grace so that he would accomplish his ultimate plan? See, there's something about God that he doesn't mind taking a broken vessel that the world would count as being worthless and bringing forth a beautiful miracle. 
Because see, God says in Matthew 19, 26, with God, all things are possible. Looking at myself in the mirror sometimes and knowing quite well who I have been and quite well what I'm capable of doing, I am thankful because if not careful, I can look in the mirror and see the absolute impossibilities. And yet God says all things are possible. He also says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So don't give up. Rather, give up all of yourself to Jesus. You got that? Don't give up. Give up all of yourself to Jesus. You give it all. And there's a, so much that you're going to get in return. You know, we've all, probably not necessarily all of us, but a lot of us that are, say, uh, in a status that we would call ourselves mature, and that's not necessarily designated by the, the age of your life. But I found this that I want to share with you because some of you can kind of maybe appreciate something. You know, when children are four years old, they look at their dad and they say, man, my dad can do anything. And when they're eight years old, they go, dad doesn't know. When they're 12 years old, they go, oh, well, naturally father doesn't understand. Four, uh, 14 years old, just a few years later, father, hopelessly old-fashioned, <coughs> will never understand what's going on. 21 years old, oh, that man is so out of date. What would you expect out of him? 25 years old. Nah, he comes up with a good idea every so often. 30 years old. I need to find out what dad thinks about this. 35 years old. Let's have a little patience. Let's get dad's input first. Now we jump to 50. I wonder what dad would have thought about that. 60. And I almost think about this every day. I wish I could talk it over with my dad once more. It's an interesting perspective on how we see our fathers through the, through the ages, huh? You know, my dad was, was a good guy, hard worker, union bricklayer. He taught me how to fish and to camp, ride in boats and to ride a bike and how to fix just about all kinds of stuff. Uh, he exhibited a life of a guy that really always tried to choose the right way. Later in life, he was someone that I found I could, cons I could literally discuss anything with. And it's been four and a half years since I lost him. Was he perfect? No. Was he flawed? Yes. A side note is that it was not until after I grew up and my mom had long since passed away that I ever even heard the words, I love you, come out of his mouth. But see... I knew he loved me. I saw by the way he acted. I saw the kind of actions that he did. He just didn't know how to say it. But then I would hear stories about how he would be around my, their friends and how he would just boast about his sons and all that they did. And the only way I knew would have known that is that my mom took the time to tell me. But see, my dad, and I'm thankful for this, he wasn't afraid to say the hard things. I'm sure that probably no one else other than me in here was as stubborn and as hard-headed as I was when I was growing up. But my dad was not afraid to tell me, even though he knew I might get mad and then I might back away from him, et cetera, et cetera. And he stayed that way all the years of my life, as long as he was here. But even though my dad wasn't really in church and he really didn't go to church, as God changed my life, then he got an opportunity to begin to see and, and live sort of vicariously through all the ministries and all the miracles of God that he was seeing because he never heard of such things that were happening in, in anybody's life. But he got to learn of that and experience that. And I got the blessing to affirm that his acceptance of Jesus Christ before he died, many, several years before that. But coming from this kind of background, you know, I decided to try to be the best dad that I knew in my old life. And you know what? I messed up. I failed at it miserably. And, you know, then I started following Christ, and I thought, well, I, I, I'm going to do everything right. Guess what? I failed. 
Now, I'm not saying that it has to always be that way. But the difference in the two places in, in my life over the years was that now I understood what redemption was. Now I understood what mercy was. Now I understood what forgiveness was. And those were the things that encouraged me. Those should be the things that encourage you. When you fall down, get up. Because God's going to be right there to help you up. Because see, and whether you knew it or not, he's never left you. He's always walking right beside you. You know, if you had a father that did everything right, praise the Lord, sister, for uh, I love the fact that how you testified about your daddy. And I'm, and I'm quite sure that this is no new news, but as, even as good as he or any father may have ever been, they're still flawed. They're not perfect. Oh, I know we want them to be, but, you know, and when I compare anything in light of the goodness of God, it's pretty hard, you know, to find perfection. But if you grew up and you didn't have such a good experience with your dad or, or something, then I'm just going to encourage you right now today, forgive him. Because that's good for you. And that's honoring to God. If you are a father... No matter where you're at in the course of any kind of failure or falling or whatever the case may be, I want you to forgive yourself today. And you need to hear this because God already has. Jesus didn't go to the cross haphazardly. He didn't go there and say, okay, some two, 3,000 years later, okay, then I'll forgive him when he sins. No, he had to carry all the sin of mankind. From the very beginning, he knew everything that we were going to need. And that sin was running deep and rooted all the way through every bit of mankind. So it doesn't matter whether you were born 1,000 years ago or born even of today or even as Lord, before the Lord comes, how many hundreds of years or years we have left, the reality is that he has paid the price for that sin already. And we have to receive it because we will fail. But there's always hope. Say that with me. Always hope. Come on, loud. Always hope. And I'll prove it. The word says, Lamentations 3, 22, 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because our Father God has known from the beginning. He knows even this moment, and he will forever know what is best for us. And it is this, to receive, to know, and to live in the love that he has for each one of us. By the greatest evidence he's ever gave us, Jesus Christ, the exalted Son of God, the Savior of the world. For you see, God knows where you are. He sees you. Can you feel him right now? He's here. His word tells us that, that he draws close to the brokenhearted. When everything's good with me, if I'm not careful, Brother Doug, I don't hear. But man, when things aren't going right and my heart gets broken, and my spirit is broken before a holy God, he can whisper and I can hear him. That's incredible. Because he knows where you are. He sees what you're going through. He sees what you've been through. And he, incredibly, he knows what you're getting ready to go through. And he knows your name. I was going to sing this song, but I'm, I think that time-wise, I may be running out. So I'm just going to sing an a cappella because I want you to hear these words. I have a father. He calls me his own. He'll never leave me, no matter where I go. He knows my name. He knows my name.
my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. You ever heard that song? Yeah, man. That's our Father. I found this poem. And it just says, what is a father? And it's just kind of a, I don't know, it's just, it just kind of struck me. It says, he's strength and security, laughter and fun, a prince to his daughter, a pal to his son, a great storyteller and a mender of toys, who's seldom dismayed by his family's noise. He's an everyday Santa who brings home surprises, the man to consult when a problem arises as eager a worker as ever they'll be, who wants all the best for his family. He's a loving instructor who struggles to teach his child to achieve all the goals one could reach. And he knows his heart that it's worth all the bother when he hears his child say, that man, that's my father. See, I believe God feels the same way about us. When we say, yes, you, oh God, you, you are my father. You are the one who loves me most. Yes, you, oh God, are all of our father. It is to you.